Summary of the Disappearing Spoon by Sam Keen. In the beginning, Keen talks about how, as a child, he was interested in the mercury inside thermometers. He became interested in the periodic table after finding out that mercury was an element. Keen wants to tell stories in The Disappearing Spoon about how the elements on the periodic table affect human society. Most people know what the table looks like, but it might scare them or make them feel unmotivated. Keen talks about the table's most important parts, like how every piece is needed and if you took away just one, the whole thing would stop making sense. He also says that for the elements, geography is destiny, which means that where they are on the periodic table determines what traits they have. Keen then talks about how atoms are put together. Atoms are made up of protons, neutrons, and electrons. He talks about the different parts of the period table, which show groups of elements like noble gases, halogens, rare earths, acids, alkalis, and transition metals. Keen says that life on Earth is based on carbon, but some science fiction writers have thought that life on other planets might be based on silicon, which is the element on the periodic table that comes after carbon. Even though this is kind of possible, silicon has properties that make it a very unusual place for life to start. Keen also talks about germanium, which is an element that, along with silicon, had a chance of being used a lot in electronics. In the end, silicon won, which is why the area is called Silicon Valley. Keen tells the story of how Robert Bunsen, whose name is on the Bunsen burner, used a spectroscope to look at the light that elements gave off. This led to a lot of progress in the study of elements. But after this, Dmitry Mendeleev made the first version of the periodic table, which would be changed many times in the years to come. Scientists thought for a long time that all the elements had always been there. But this idea later changed to say that hydrogen, helium, and lithium were the only elements that existed at the beginning of the universe, during the Big Bang. All of the other elements were made in stars. When a star collapsed and blew up again, it became a supernova and sent out a cloud of dust that later turned into the sun and planets. A graduate student named Claire Patterson was the first person to correctly figure out how old the Earth is. He used the method of radioactive dating to come up with the number 4.55 billion years. Keen then talks about chemical weapons, which has been around since ancient Greece but didn't get very good until World War I. Fritz Haber, a German scientist, devoted his life to making chlorine and bromine weapons that were especially cruel and had terrible effects on their victims. He also came up with a way to capture nitrogen, which was used to make ammonia, a fertilizer that has helped billions of people around the world grow food. In 1939, the American physicist Luis Alvarez heard about the work of the German scientist Otto Hahn on nuclear fission, which is the process of splitting a uranium atom. At the time, people didn't know much about how radiation worked. The US and its partners started a research program called the Manhattan Project. The goal of this project was to study nuclear fission so that atomic weapons could be made. The project used a way of experimental calculations called the Monte Carlo method, which later became the basis for using computers to do calculations in scientific research. Later, when the Cold War was going on, the US and the Soviet Union were in a race to find and name new elements. Keen talks about Linus Pauling and Emilio Segre, two very smart scientists who are known for making two of the worst mistakes in the history of science. Even though mistakes can sometimes help science move forward, Pauling and Segre did not make this kind of mistake. Elements can often be harmful. At the beginning of the 20th century in Japan, Cadmium from the Kamioka mines leaked into nearby rice fields. This made people sick with a disease called Itai Itai or Ouch Ouch. At the same time, people have been poisoned on purpose with things like thallium and polonium. In the 1990s, a young American named David Hahn killed himself by trying to build a nuclear plant in his backyard. Many elements can also be used to make medicines, but how they affect the body, for better or worse, can be hard to predict. For example, when U.S. Senate candidate Stan Jones ate silver because it was good for his health, he turned blue. Two scientists, Gerhard Domach and Louis Pasteur, 
broke scientific rules when they gave patients experimental drugs in a non-scientific setting. In both cases, the risk was worth it, and the patients got better. In a similar way, antibiotics were made possible by Pasteur's study on drugs that stopped bacteria from multiplying. Elements can be hard to predict and can trick you. For example, modern prosthetics came about when a Swedish doctor named Peringvar Brunemark put a titanium window in a rabbit to see what was going on inside. He then noticed that the skin cells of the rabbit bonded to the titanium. Titanium came to be used in devices because of this discovery. Keen talks about more than just the chemical elements themselves. He also talks about the emotional and professional problems that scientists have run into while working with these elements over the years. Marie Curie was one of the most important scientists in history, but she almost didn't become a scientist at all because women in Warsaw, Poland, where she was born, were not allowed to go to school. Curie got two Nobel Prizes, one in physics and one in chemistry. She also changed the way people thought about radioactivity at the time. Lise Meitner, on the other hand, was an Austrian scientist who was Jewish. She worked well with a German partner, Otto Hahn, until he betrayed her by taking all the credit for their work while she was hiding during World War II. Elements have been used in medicine and the military, but they have also played a big part in the history of money. They were often used as money, so counterfeiters also used them. At the age of 23, scientist Charles Hall found a way to separate the aluminium and oxygen that are naturally bound together in the Earth's soil. This made it possible to mass-produce aluminium for use in homes. With this find, he made a lot of money. Throughout the history of science, the problem of pathological science has come up again and again. Pathological science is when people use scientific-looking tools to support ideas that aren't true. But there have been times when real, hard science has been lied about. Two scientists, B. Stanley Poss and Martin Fleischmann, claimed to have found cold fusion but actually changed their data. This was one of the worst cases. Keane moves on from his talk about pathological science to talk about modern study into the periodic table. This is often done by cooling things to very low temperatures, at which point they act differently than they would normally. Albert Einstein and the Indian scientist Satyendra Nath Bose worked together to figure out that atoms can change into a new state of matter if they are cold enough. This was a very important discovery, but it took years to figure out how to cool atoms enough to show that it was true. Bubble science, which looks at bubbles left over from chemical breakdown, and froth science, which looks at element bubbles from inside rocks, are also at the cutting edge of current periodic table research. In the second to last part of the book, Keane talks about national bureaus of standards and measurements, which do a lot to make sure that science is accurate. Recently, these offices and the scientific community as a whole have been trying to figure out if one of science's basic constants, alpha, which is the tightness of the connection between an electron and a nucleus, might not be constant after all. Even if it's only by a tiny amount and slowly, the idea that alpha might be going up has huge implications for science. At the end of the book, Keane gives a list of more recent study on the elements that are happening now. He says that the current version of the periodic table is not the only one possible, even though it is still very important and useful. He dreams about many different kinds of tables and wonders how they would compare to the way an alien species would show the elements. About the author Sam Keane was born in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he is very proud of his city. Keane got a bachelor's degree in English and physics from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and a master's degree in library science from the Catholic University of America. His first book, the Disappearing Spoon was well received by critics and sold a lot of copies. It was a bestseller and one of the top 10 science books of 2010 according to the Royal Society. In the same way, Keane's other books try to make science understandable to a wide range of people, often by using funny or surprising stories from the past of science. Keane has written four books and has also written for magazines like The Atlantic and The New York Times Magazine. He also talks on the radio and gives guest lectures all over the world on a daily basis. He is a resident of Washington, D.C. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. 
please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.